That's a rocket. Hi, I'm Paul, and I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about Earth's personal savior, Doctor Who. Classic Whovians are well aware that there's a vast catalog of information defining who Doctor Who is, Time Lord physiology, Gallifrey. The good news is for you, you don't need to know any of that. Because when they made the series originally, they had none of this information. The entire intrigue was Doctor Who, about whom we knew nothing. William Hartnell, the first character actor to play Doctor Who, was originally known in the 1920s as a Shakespearean actor for the BBC. He accepted the role because he wanted to be a little more kid-friendly. So he took the children's role where he played the lovable grandfather to an alien granddaughter. Hartnell basically defined who the Doctor was. He described the personality of Doctor Who as essentially being a cross between a wizard, the Wizard of Oz, and Father Christmas. When we first meet Hartnell in the series, two teachers are looking for a student who has demonstrated ridiculous knowledge about the past and knowledge about science and physics that she really just shouldn't have. They follow her, sort of stalkery, into a junkyard where they notice her disappear into a police box. They come across a cantankerous old man who's rather abrupt and wants to have nothing to do with him. And they insist that they saw their student, Susan Foreman, come into the junkyard and disappear into the police box. He swears he didn't hear her, he didn't see her, at which point they assume, naturally, that he has abducted her and locked her inside. They break into the police box only to discover it's bigger on the inside. The teachers are naturally confused, and at which point Susan comes into the room and explains that she is not, in fact, a regular Earth student. That's how she knows so much. She's actually the granddaughter of the old man. He is known as the Doctor, and they are travelers in the fourth dimension. The Doctor goes on to explain that they are exiled or cut off from their own people. They never really explain why. Susan goes on to explain that the spaceship she has come to call the TARDIS. She takes this as an acronym from the description on the time travel capsule, which is Time, time and, and relative, relative Dimension, dimension in, in space. space. We come to learn that the reason that this amazing spaceship looks like a police box in the 1960s is because its chameleon circuit is broken. After all, they stole the ship because they're in exile, so they don't really know how to work it. The teachers are a little dubious. They don't believe them. They don't think it's a spaceship. So the doctor, in what seems to be a bit of a panic, launches them back in time to 100,000 BC. We run into a tribe of Stone Age cavemen, this is the tribe of gum, and a series of adventures ensues. Originally, when the series was launched, it was meant to be an educational series. So we would have historical pieces, and you would learn about different time periods. There would also be futuristic episodes where they would focus on science or scientific possibilities. They later go on and visit Marco Polo, Harry Houdini, Ancient Rome, the Aztecs. Despite having the desire to make things better, Doctor Who has a very hard line that nothing can be changed when they go back in time. This is seen most clearly in the Aztecs when his granddaughter, who's never explained how he's actually related to her, wants to stop human sacrifice. He insists that you can't change the way in which people function and that they must be respected and leave things alone. In addition to the chameleon circuit being broken on the TARDIS, the Doctor's not really sure how to control it. After all, he did steal, borrow the machine. He did have a small notebook which gave the instructions on how to control it specifically, but he dropped it, so it's sort of a hit or miss, and each time he moves the spaceship, it might be his next leap home. The other big draw for Doctor Who is, of course, the fabulous monsters. The first, and of course the most formidable of these, is the Daleks. Now, Daleks are originally supposed to be the survivors of a very terrible, terrible nuclear war. Their bodies have been horribly mutated, and somehow they've managed to get their distorted figures into metal cans. These are horrible fascist sociopaths bent on destruction and destroying everything that isn't Dalek. It's almost impossible to not think of Nazis when you see the Daleks and their desire on wiping out everything that isn't like them. Robo Hitler. As the series progresses, the companions change over time. Eventually, Susan, the Doctor's granddaughter, gets fed up with bouncing around space, so she falls in love with a human resistance fighter. The Doctor leaves her on the planet, and now he's left with just the two teachers, and he travels around and plays with them for a bit. He picks up a stowaway, Steven Taylor, and he also picks up a, an orphan named Vicky a little bit later. They go on adventures where they take them to Northumbria during 1066, where the Doctor interacts with a time meddler. The Doctor interacts with, for the first time, someone of his own planet.
planet. The Time Meddler only exists for a few episodes, and he's neither really good nor bad. He just likes to mess with things, which we've already established is not something the Doctor is about. Eventually, the Doctor swaps Vicky and Steven for Polly and Ben, two young urchins that he picked up in a nightclub in 1966. No, that's the actual plot. This establishes a relationship between the Doctor and the companions that stays throughout the series, where we have the older, wiser man leading around the two younger children who help keep him young in spirit. The final episode in the 10th planet, Polly and Ben fight off the Cybermen. Turns out, Earth had a twin called Mondas. Mondas got thrown out of the sun's orbit and started to lose its ability to produce resources like Earth did. Even though we're twins, Earth is developing a little more like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mondas is the Danny DeVito half. In order to survive, Mondas decides that they will get together all of the bad parts and replace them with electronic counterparts, essentially becoming droids. They decide that they can use these technological gizmos to put together and take over other civilizations. Additionally, in order to keep themselves from going insane, they manage to find a way to fly their planet around. If that doesn't sound like a precursor to the Borg, nothing does. In their attack, it turns out that too much of a toll is taken on the Doctor. He seems to have died but he doesn't. This is where it gets weird. He starts to regenerate and become another human being. Thus, the idea of regeneration is born. And Patrick Troughton takes over the role for the second Doctor. The top 10 reasons William Hartnell defined Doctor Who. 10. Contrary to popular belief, not all police boxes looked like the TARDIS police box. Now, the series maintained the basic shape of the police box throughout. The basic police box design was originally sighted in the streets of London in 1923 and was the police box Mark I Metropolitan Police Box. Nine. The family tree of the doctor and Susan is never explained. Never explained. How many years? 63? Since 1963, no one has explained this. Eight. Vicky accidentally explains the TARDIS as time and relative dimensions with an S in space. This mistake stays with the series for years to come. The mistake isn't officially corrected until Rose Tyler gets hold of it in the reboot of the series. Seven. It is not until the second Doctor that we even know the name Time Lord. It's not until the third Doctor with John Pertwee that we know what Gallifrey is. 10-0-11-0-0-0-0. Two, six. six! When the Doctor gets a toothache, he decides the best place to go in the whole galaxy is the OK Corral so that Doc Holliday can treat his toothache. Once there, all of the gunslingers get them together and they have a big old sing-along. Five. Five. Use your personal TARDIS and go back in time and revisit number six. Four. Four! Some argue that the time meddler or the meddling monk is a precursor for the doctor's arch nemesis, the master. Three. Three. When William Hartnell accepted the role, he was already suffering from undiagnosed arteriosclerosis. When he was in production, there were some difficulties in him saying the lines. He made an actor character choice early on so that he could flub lines or make mistakes or mispronounce names. He frequently called Ian Chesterton Chesterbot or Chatterbox. Two. Two. The regeneration was born out of necessity rather than a planned idea. As Hartnell began to deteriorate with the arteriosclerosis, he got to the point where he couldn't really say the lines at all. However, the show had become so popular they wanted to continue it. So they came up with an idea for the alien to actually have the ability to regenerate, shed his skin, become a completely new personality, and develop a completely new perspective on the world, thus adding to the mystery of Doctor Who. One. William Hartnell was reportedly rather difficult to work with, and according to some reports of those who worked with him, he was a bit of a British nationalist and anti-Semite. He complained rather loudly on the set of Invasion of the Daleks that one of the extras was a Jew. It's ironic that the character that he originated becomes one of the greatest champions for diversity, preservation, respect, and honor for all living things in the universe. Whether intentional or incredibly coincidental, the disconnect between the actor's worldview and the persona of the Doctor plays out in the character itself later in the series, when later Doctors deal with the existential crisis of the Father Christmas-like Savior and the fact that they carry the guilt of 
countless genocides as a result of the Time War. It's difficult to say what William Hartnell would think of the series he came to spawn, but his opinion is likely summed up in some of his last lines when he revisited the role in The Three Doctors. In talking to Doctors 2 and 3, he looks at them with contempt and says, Oh, you're my replacements. A dandy and a clown. Thanks for watching. And if there's anything you want explained, just drop it right there.